For all he's done for me, and <clears throat> I just um, wanted to share this about, I mean, I know a lot of you know about back in 1999 when, uh, well, let me back back up. I don't know if that many people know right now, I think about eight people, about that. Uh, you know, I've been feeling tired and fatigued, and, um, you know, I, a lot of you know me that I'm all the time going, going, going. I remember Sister Tally is like, you just make me tired when I hear you doing everything. <laughs> you just make me tired, girl, slow down. And, of course, she's not the first one that's always told me to slow down. Well, God is telling me to slow down. And um, I, I went and um, made an appointment last Monday, this Monday week. And uh, my heart rate is 40 instead of 80 and 90. And so they scheduled me for my cardiologist which he can't get me in till December 10th. And, you know, yeah, I got a little upset at first, and I was like, you know, 
wow, I need to get in quicker than that. The way Dr. McDonald was telling me, you know, I need to take care of this right away. And well, I um, called them and they said, I'm sorry, but he's out of state and he won't be in. You'll be the first appointment for him when he comes back. I said, okay, okay, I'll wait. So then yesterday, no, not yesterday, Friday, my regular Dr. McDonald's called. But uh, I felt two days later, I felt like, okay, a, a day later, I felt a little peace about it. I was like, well, wait a minute. Um, that, that's 22 days. At that time, it was 22 days. And I said, I'm, that's time for me to give Dr. Jesus a chance to work on my heart, to give me strength, and he can do it. So, I mean, I started feeling actually better, and I texted a couple of people and told them, you know, that's what, you know, I was happy to, that I have a peace about it. You know, I'm not going to worry for the days till I got to go see him. And then it, he brought back my mind, to my mind, which what I was going to start with is back in 1999 when I had a heart attack, my first one, um, uh, they had, they said that I had like, you know, three, I think, or at the time, arteries clogged in. So the day that they were going to go do whatever they were supposed to do, Brother Weiniger and Stan and Philip went with me, and <clears throat> they were all sitting there when the doctor do the thing, the wire thing, and check, and he scratched his head, and he's like, I don't know what to tell you, but other than Miss Fisher, you have a perfect heart. And I'm like, I know what happened. And I said, he did it. And so if he did it then, he can do it again. And if he doesn't, I will still trust him no matter what because he's doing everything for a reason. And I know that a lot of that suffering and whatever, you know, has come to, uh, it's from the negative come to positive. And I, I'm so appreciative of what he's doing in our lives. And, and um, more and more, I'm learning to appreciate the trials and the tests because that's what's making me stronger and making me more aware to, I need to get closer and closer to God. And, and I, I try, when I can't sleep, I try to, um, you know, play music. And, you know, any time that I listen to the Bible, because I listen to the, I don't read the actual words. I listen like Brother Tuck, not Brother Tucker, Brother Smith was telling us about, a certain man, but I have a different one, Brother Smith. I don't know which one. Elisha's the one that put it on my phone. It's it. They all play out their parts. You know, women talking there, and when it's we're talking about a woman or children, and and then when like I was doing the Daniel when he went into the lions, the lions they growl and all that. So he gets, you know, it doesn't make me go to sleep. But then there's parts that yeah, uh, it does get a little, you know, where I don't understand. And they start repeating the begettings and all that stuff. And But um, every time that I read, it's like 4 o'clock in the morning. And I was telling Philip last night that I said, I, I've had questions. And I know that he's always telling me, Mama, write them down, write them down. And I, and 4 o'clock, you know, I'm not thinking about no notebook or paper. And I'm kind of, you know, tired and groggy and all that. And, and he goes, Marco Polo me, Mama. I'm like, oh, I didn't want to disturb you. He goes, you won't disturb me. So... I read my Bible today, but I didn't get any quests, any end things, so I didn't. So there's no more Apollo for you, Philip. But um, I, I will start doing that because it's like God is revealing, making me understand a little bit more and stuff, and questioning. I didn't used to question. I used to be like, yeah, okay, if it's there, God said it. I believe it. Final story. But and I never questioned the ministry or anything because it's that's God's department. Mind my book, you know. But I know that I have to have my own vision, which I do have a vision of the body of Christ. And I'm thankful, very, very thankful that God brought my family in. And I, I, um, <laughs> I, know, I can't remember the sister they used to say, because Brother Tucker used to repeat it about, um, by God, uh, he brought me in. And the only way somebody, uh, he, he kicks me out. Or I can't remember, but Sister Ann, you probably know. But something about kicking out too. But anyway, um, I, I'm I'm here. In other words, <clears throat> only way I'm going to leave is in a casket. And uh, so, <laughs> you know, I'm sorry you have to put up with me. And um, and but you know what? I, I'm going to be making you perfect because I know that some of my uh, I'm going to say who, but some have helped me to keep 
not made me perfect, but make me a better person, make me, give me more compassion, give me more understanding, and that's what I need, and I need to be more loving, because God loved us, even if we're like uh, kids that are not behaving like little kids do, we, the parents love them anyway, well, he loved us, so why can't we love each other that, that's not very lovable, because I know I might not be lovable at times, and, um, and I used to be the type of person that I used to tell Philip, why, Philip? I've never done anything wrong to this person. I, and I love them. I don't hate anybody. He goes, Mama, everybody's different. He goes, God's got to work on them. Don't worry about it. You just do your part. And that's what I've been doing because I love everybody. I don't have an enemy. Uh, you know, the Bible said, love your enemies. Well, I don't really have enemies. Maybe they, the, I'm their enemy, but uh, I don't have enemies. And, and I keep praying for God to give me a clean heart creating me a clean heart so I can love more and help people out there that need my help. And I'm working on one person. So I guess it's like one day at a time, one person at a time. So um, I just wanted to be able to tell the ones that knew and prayed for me, continue to pray. And God's will in my life, he's in control. And whatever happens, I'm still going to trust him. always dealt with me but it, lately it seems like I'm I'm like brother Smith's Bible study I had he gives it to me at home first and then I get it again here but I never thought about taking each commandment and going through it in my mind you know just say the commandments you know, honor thy father mother you know just go down the line but to take each one I never thought about doing that. I never thought about really understanding what God was saying to us. But the main thing I wanted to say is I feel like um, I've gotten complacent, or I guess that's the word to use in my walk. And uh, like everybody else this year, uh, I've been, we've been through a lot with uh, the COVID and loved ones and friends. And, and it's not just COVID. It's other diseases and other things happening and pressure. But so um, I have a tendency, and I confess this not so long ago, to be a little negative. So I kind of shut everything out. And trying to spend more time with the Lord. And I was um, listening to a song the other day. Uh, Cheryl Neptune was singing. And um, of course when I'm up here I can't remember the words. But I kept thinking. That's how I felt when I came. That's how I felt when I came here. See whether you're born in here. Or you come in like we did. Either from the world or from religion. There's a time that you see and you feel and you want and you have a desire and there's a light shining. And what hit me the other day was my husband uh, put this, these, uh, I think it was six LED lights in, over our mirror. And he was so happy he did this for me. And... <laughs> He said, what do you think? And I looked in the mirror and I went, oh, my God. <laughs> he said, what's wrong? I said, I see everything. 
every little wrinkle, every <laughs> That sounds funny, but I thought, how many times have I sang that song? Lord, shine your light all around me that I might see. Do I really want to see? Do I really want to see? When I came, I, I thought I wanted to see. But sometimes we don't want to see. We don't want to see what God's saying. We don't want to see what God's doing. We don't want to see who we are. And I don't know, ever since he put that light up, I mean, it's hard to go in there and do my hair, but... <laughs> No, but it's a woman thing, and when you're 71, you don't really understand it. But anyway, um, I thought, Lord, I do. I, I, I want to feel exactly how I felt when I found this way. But I want more light to shine on me, not to shine on me, but to shine so I can see, so I can see more your truth, not all my, I want to see my faults, but he's the only one that can deliver me from that. I have to see them and work on them, but I want to see more, more of you and more of you in my life. And, and, and lately, I've, it's just been, you know, you thought, well, you've been going to church for 51 years. You're just, no, no I've been like this for a long time. But lately, I think, I don't know if I'm making sense or not, but. I want more light. I want. I do want the Bible studies my husband's given me at home, and when I come to church and they do it. But I want a deeper relationship with my Jesus, a deeper one. I have one, but I want more. I want more of Him, and I want more light. And I just appreciate the service today and the spirit we felt, and the and um, and and it's hard it's hard because uh, uh, our culture is as we all gather around we go to the altar and we're doing it family by family and that's wonderful but i appreciate what god's doing today i know he's got his hand i know he's working in the earth today and i just love what i've been feeling in these services and i really appreciate the light yeah. like sister Lineker when when brother Lineker held up that came in and she had her dress ironing and pressing her white dress and he came in and turned on the light and she started seeing all the stains and the things what was wrong with that white dress because he turned on the light and when brother smith turned that light on i could see that i need to clean my mirror better i could see, <laughs> I could see but i cleaned that mirror <laughs> but but I want more light in my life. I want to see. 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 I don't want to be blind to what God's doing today. I want to see. I want to see. Oh, la, la, la. Yes. Oh, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Well, my uh, sister, go, go ahead, Sister Atkins. Dave, I appreciate God. I appreciate that song. I bless your name. I will bless your name. I give you honor and I give you praise. 
I praise God for that. It just seemed like I, I, I just felt so grateful and I feel so honored, you know, to be one of his child or one of his children. I, I appreciate God. I'm thankful today. That's all. I just want to tell God, thank you, thank you, thank you. Day. It feels like forever, but you know, um, like Linda said, all the things that you go through, um, you know, makes you a better person. And I know uh, since I've been gone, I, I, when you miss some services, it kind of weighs on your spirit. And I thought, Lord, I don't want to step back. I want to keep moving forward. And uh, it just came to me, if you take one step forward, then two steps back. And I thought, Lord, I, I know you're there. You haven't left me. Your word says that you never leave me or forsake me. So I, I started putting that into practice and, and leaning on him more and reaching out. I thought, I'm not going to just take this time sitting back doing nothing and, and um, you know, not I may not be at church right now, but at least I can do something at home to uh, keep my spirit up and keep uh, myself lifted up in him. So I made that uh, uh, every morning. And uh, it, you know, you go through things in life, and I know what I've been through lately has really, it's on me as a person. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful. And uh, I just, Brother Smith, I want to tell you, I had never done this before, but I want to repent to you. I love you, Brother Smith. You're my pastor, and I honor you more than anything. And I do repent to you. Um, I'm not going to go into it because that's between me and you, but I am so thankful for you, so thankful for each and every one in this church. And I'm thankful most of all what the Lord is doing in my life. He's brought me so far, even if I was at home. I grew. I feel like I've grown in my spirit. And uh, I just want to work harder. I want to uh, bless him today because he's so worthy. He's so worthy. I mean, I had a heart attack. I lived through it. That's amazing. That is amazing. Every time I think of that, I think, Lord, I don't know why you felt me worthy of, of to live through that, but I know you got something for me to do. And I'm trying to find that. I'm trying to work on that. And I'm trying to, you know, I'm asking him a lot of questions, and Brother Smith, I do want to call you and get some direction on some things, and uh, because I do desire a closer walk, and I want to put things into practice. I don't want to take it for granted anymore, and I know I've said that a thousand times, and I don't feel like I do, but then at times when I come to church, there's times when I want to get up and testify, and I think, oh, what I got to say isn't important. Because who am I? But, you know, if the Lord's going to call me and he's going to bring me here, then I've got to do my part. And, uh, so forgive me for that. And, and uh, I just love everyone, and I'm so thankful to the Lord. And, you know, uh, you say that a lot, but you, you can never be thankful enough uh, for what the Lord has done. Uh, I've been doing this challenge. I heard uh, Sister Nona mention it a couple uh, weeks ago in church a 10-day challenge where you write down things that the Lord's done for you or you're thankful for the, what the Lord's done for you. And every day I wrote that down, and I tell you, it does something for your spirit. And each day you can look back and say, wow, you notice a change in how you wrote things down. And I'm just so thankful to the Lord. I can't even express it enough how thankful I am to the Lord. And I'm thankful for each and every one of you. God. Um, 
I, uh, I want to say a little bit more about what we had in Bible study this morning. Um, <clears throat> um, first off, I'd just like to thank everyone that is faithful to the Bible studies. That's the backbone of this church, those that are faithful to Bible study, because that's where you actually are going to get the principles and get the right down where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, of, uh, like my wife was saying, the light, where you're really going to get understanding, because there's where we deal with the principles of doctrine and, and the really fundamental foundation of our teachings, and uh, which is very, very important. Uh, you're not going to get in our worship services up here. These are uh, uh, I guess I would say a, uh, a furthering of what we're getting downstairs. The worship of it. The, but if you don't get that foundation put in you, and that's why I'm I'm uh, maybe a little bit different than some, but I mean we could have service up here where we could go through all that and have a four or five hour service like we used to have. <laughs> you know, you can do it several different ways, but um, anyway, I, I like the having the the fellowship downstairs. I like the servitude of those that prepare. You know our our little breakfast for us, and uh, there's there's a lot of things that are there that sometimes you don't even think about that uh, enhance our our assembly, and uh, those. Uh, of course, I'm a Bible teacher, so I I love teaching. I love the I love making sure the Word of God gets planted in the people of God. And uh, so I just want to, I want everyone that's faithful to Bible studies to know how much I appreciate you. I appreciate, you know, and I, and I hope that those that don't feel to be there will soon, someday change their uh, thinking on that and become a part of it because I know they're missing the greater part. <clears throat> I mean, church worship is important, but if you don't know what you're worshiping, if you're just here for feeling. You know, in, in worship, this is where our emotions are touched. This is uh, the Spirit of God touches us. We have an opportunity of expressing our worship to God emotionally, and we have an ex we have an opportunity to feel God's, um, you know, His emotions by the Spirit of God. I I don't know how many of you felt it, but in that song, Sister Cindy was singing there was a certain point of it that a deeper covering came in. And, you know, that's something we look for in the body of Christ is, is that presence of God, that covering. There's a special covering in the body of Christ you won't find anywhere else. And I get worried if we go very long without feeling that. If that, server, if that covering don't come in here, I begin to ask, question myself and question God. Um, you know, it's important because a lot of people don't, they don't know the difference between the body of Christ and other churches. Some people haven't come to that knowledge yet or that revelation. And, uh, you know, it's one of the reasons here recently I taught on understanding and helping other people, new people to understand that the early church fell away and what scriptures to use to be, to understand, because if you don't understand the early church fell away and we are in a restoration of trying to get what the early church had, which we have a lot of it, but we are not finished yet. We're not fully restored. If a person don't understand that, when you read the Bible, 
you're reading men who were talking to a people that had a full sevenfold life. And we don't have all what they had, and we can't apply all those scriptures to us yet. That's what we're longing for. That's what we're reaching out to, to, to uh, uh, finally to have what the early church had so everything they were saying can be applied to us. But you can't, uh, you can't exactly apply all of that to us. You just got to say that's our hope right there. What they had is our hope. That's what we got to have. That's what we're working for. But until you understand that, you'll be confused because just like out here in this religious world, they're claiming all of that. They don't have it, and they're claiming something that's unobtainable. It, it, where they're at in the Lord, especially many people out there that don't even have the depths of the keys of knowledge and understanding. It's very shallow. Brother and Sister Durham, you know, Brother Durham went to California and to help. Uh, uh, he's the executor of the, his father's estate, and him passing away, Brother Durham had to go there and take care of a lot of the things to get 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 the estate settled for the family, for the heirs. And uh, while they were there, they visited the church a couple times, I think. And uh, he called me, and he told me, he said, I don't know how people live on this. I used to tell people uh, in Springfield, I used to say, I want you to go visit some other churches. Visit a Catholic church, and a Presbyterian church, and a Methodist church. And I said, visit a few churches. It'll give you an appreciation for where you're at. And... Um, and I don't mean to throw off on those, but I just know that God has gave us a greater depth of what he's working on, and those people will come out of her, my people, uh, before God's finished, he will call all of his people into one body. People don't understand that out there. They don't understand they're not in the body of Christ. It's a revelation to get that. Anyway, we were talking downstairs, and <clears throat> and uh, we were talking on the fifth commandment: honor thy father and thy mother. Um, <clears throat> so that your days would be long here on earth. It's the first commandment with promise. And of course, we we went into it about how. You know, the, the depth of what God was getting at in that commandment was is that you learn how to respect and honor authority. Uh, even God, <laughs> you, you may find this a little bit difficult, but God even wants us to have, the, have respect and show honor to those who misuse authority over. Uh, sometimes that part's a little bit uh, not, it's a little bit difficult to understand, but I'll give you a couple of scriptures that I didn't have time to give downstairs um, because you know if, when you when you begin to honor and and here's what the law was under the under the old covenant the law was if you disrespected your mother or your father you were to be stoned. God wanted you out of Israel. He did not want anybody that had that kind of influence against order, against authority, against where honor and respect should be. He wanted that judged. And, um, and of course, you know, it, all, it comes all the way down to us that it's, God was, he was planning a principle that we are to have the proper respect for those that are in authority and those that uh, are our elders, uh, you, you'll learn in life, our young people will learn that many people, even if they're not righteous, they've got experience and they have learned things of what works and what don't work <laughs> to an extent. You can learn by their mistakes too. You can learn by the, the, 
you know, where they're missing these principles of God. If you get them, you'll see uh, it'll just plant in you stronger why these principles are so precious. Anyway, I wanted to read a couple to you here. One's in 1 Timothy 5, in the first verse. It says, because honoring your mother and father, that's number one, that's going to teach you to honor God. You know, you're not going to, gee, uh, if, who was it? John said, if you honor not man whom you have seen, how are you going to honor God whom you have not seen? And um, so it all boils down to the, the, the crux of the matter is, is the proper honor to have the proper honor. I was given in Bible study the four principles of faith, humility, the fear of God, and honor. Those things, those principles have to be wrought in our lives. You, you cannot serve God, nor can you be righteous without those principles. And I was also saying, you know, these commandments, if you're to serve a commandment, is very necessary in your walk with God, whether you understand it or don't, if you'll obey if in obedience, that has to do with humility, learning how to give up the sacrifice of obedience. It's better, obedience is, how did, uh, better than sacrifice, and, uh, Sacrifice is better than witchcraft. Isn't that what it says? Well, you got to get that exactly right. Some obedience is better than witchcraft. And uh, uh, anyway, so somebody get that. We're not getting it just exactly right. It's in Isaiah. Um, so, yeah, but that's not all of it. Obedience is better than sacrifice and something which is, huh? Look it up. Somebody look it up right quick because I'm not getting that second phraseology. Um, there you go. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. See, when you decide to do your own thing and rebel against God's instructions or his word, then you're practicing serving some other God, which is really yourself or your own ideology. And obedience is better than sacrifice. So it's better to be obey than sacrifice having maybe have to go through chastisement for correction. Uh, and then rebellion is, of course, practicing witchcraft. So <clears throat> anyway, the bottom line to this this commandment of honor your mother and father has to do with honor has to do with order the, learning how to honor the proper order and authority over your life well, anyway let me give you a couple of scriptures here 1 Timothy 5 1 says rebuke not an elder but entreat him as a father and the younger men as brethren the elder women as mothers the younger as sisters with all purity Honor widows that are widows indeed. But if any widow have, a, have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home, or respect is what that means, respect and honor, and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Uh, so that's, that's one. Then in... Uh, Let's go down to the 19th verse of 1 Timothy 5. It says, Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all that others may also fear. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou... Whoops. I hit the wrong button. <clears throat> did I read last there okay now I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another 
doing nothing by partiality. So, <clears throat> you know, Paul was, he was uh, planning these, these principles in those people back there uh, among the Gentiles, being the uh, apostle to the Gentiles. Then in 1 Peter 2, here's the scripture I want to mention, 1 Peter 2, 16, goes through the 20th verse. It says, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king, servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience sake, or for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if a man be buffeted for your faults? You shall take it patiently, but if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. For even here too were you called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Remember what he told Caiaphas, the high priest? He said, you don't have any power but what God's gave, what my Father's gave you in heaven. He, you know, he recognized that what God was allowing him to go through was, was God's will for him to go through it. And he was an example of even how to be treated wrong and still have piety or respect and recognize, you know, that it was a good example to others to show when you're done wrong, take it. That's a hard one, isn't it? That one's not so easy. It's, it's easy when, you know, when somebody instructs you or you're supposed to honor and respect this person because they're respectable and honorable. But when they're not respectable, not for you to respect that, that's not so easy. And so, you know, uh, uh, that's a, these are, these are, see, that has to do with the fear of God and honor, of course, and humility. They all work together, and even faith. I mean, you've got to have faith in God. To, to get to a place where you can suffer wrongfully and take it right and not have any, uh, what did he say in, in Timothy there, not to have any uh, prejudice or not to, you know, not to lift one above the other that, you know, uh, just to realize God's, God's working on my life. These good principles are good things for us. They're good for us to rehearse, you know, from time to time, go over. Uh, those of you that hadn't been in Bible study, I've, I've showed them how the first four commandments have to do, the first four of the Ten Commandments, which is, uh, it is, uh, have no other gods before me. It's, uh, uh, make not a graven image. Take not the name of the Lord. Make not make make not a graven image is set up before you. It's an idol. Anything becomes an idol, uh, and you put before God. But then the third one is to not to take God's name in vain. That's that's. You know, this has to do the the commandment of Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not lie bear false witness, that, that's what uh, taking God's name in vain is using his name when it benefits you. 
but you, you know, in other words, you, how did uh, Paul say it when you, uh, uh, when, when uh, the scripture I'm trying to get at is uh, having the, denying the power of, a form of godliness, but denying the power of. In other words, you, you have a form of godliness, but when you, you're not really, don't have the principle that empowers you as a true witness of God, then uh, you're, um, that's, that's, that's blaspheming his name. Blaspheming means, it means to be false. It's falsehood. It's, it's a non-belief. And, uh, of course, when you use God's name in vain, you can use it in vain many ways. You can, you know, like I said, you can use his name when it's convenient that it helps you. It's not, it's not honoring God. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's where we have to keep our honor in God and be honest, not to bear false witness, not to be a liar. You know, don't let my life be that of a lie. Uh, then the fourth one is to keep the Sabbath day holy. And that has to do with you being a... Uh, you, you, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is the beginning of the fulfillment of that, that commandment. That Sabbath is entering into God's rest. God finished His work in seven days, six days, and rested on the seventh. He finished the work that actually done, he done everything in those first six days that actually ended his work for eternal life, a family to live with him throughout eternity in peace and righteousness. He fixed everything that has to be fixed in those six days. The rest of it, we're, we're, we're working through his six days to get it all worked out. And entering that rest is when, you see, we've been, we have been born of Adam. None of you were born of God like Adam was. Adam failed God and then he produced man in a corruption of, of, of a curse of God and death came on all of us because of his sin. Because we weren't born to God. We was born to man. That's why... Man's a few days and full of trouble on this earth. You get on this earth, you're born of a fallen nature. That's why you must be born again. That's what the baptism of the Holy Ghost is. It's a new birth. It's a new creature. Paul called it a new man. You're born again through that spiritual birth when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And... Uh, and so Jesus, when he came to this world, he did not. Jesus was not born of a fallen nature. He was born of God. God, a woman, uh, the woman produces an egg. The man produces the seed that Im Im impregnates the egg. And uh, the embryo grows from that. So the seed of life comes from the man. Jesus was not born of a man. He was born of his father. He wasn't born of Joseph. The woman produced an egg, so when he came to this world, he became a human. But he was like the first man, Adam. He was a God human. He was a son of God. He, he, he came all the way down from heaven, reduced to a seed, planted in the egg of a human woman. And when he was born, he was born of man. He was... And he did that so that he could be a faithful high priest to you and I. How could he know what we're going through if he didn't go through it? How could he know what we experience in this corruption unless he came here and saw it himself firsthand? That's why I've said he didn't have the advantage Adam had. Adam was born in a perfect world. Everything was good. Everything God, er, there was no curse. There was no corruption. There wasn't any sin. Adam came in that condition. 
Jesus came into this world a little baby and grew up with corruption all around him, just like you and I. But the difference in him and us, we were born of Adam in a fallen nature, and he was born of God. And that's why we had to be born again. Yeah. Yeah. How, how did Adam, when he was born of God, how, how was Adam able to sin when he wasn't born of a sinful nature? He was born of a nature that had the ability to sin. In other words, he was given a free will. He was given a mind and a free will, but he was also given the instructions of what not to do. See, Jesus, God dealt with Jesus through his angels I mean, by the time he was 12 years old, he was confounding theologians. God, God owed him that. God was his father. So God owed raising up his child the way he raised Adam up. And so the Lord, but he had the ability to sin. He was tempted in all points as we are. And he could have easily fail. That's why I'm showing you that it was easy. I mean, Jesus was, he was surrounded by corruption. You know, the psalmist said, uh, prophecy of him, said, when I saw the, 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 the prosperity of the wicked, my, not, my foot did not slip. When I saw wicked people could get rich and have whatever they wanted. And, of course, he had enough, he had enough understanding of life of how he could have built his own kingdom. He, seen, he had to go through that temptation. So he would have been, Jesus was tempted in every point that we are, and I'd even venture to say that he was the his temptation was enhanced far beyond most of us. But he wasn't corrupt that 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 he didn't have a nature he didn't have a nature that um, that could not be perfected. He had a nature that could be perfected. And our nature in Adam absolutely cannot be perfected because it's, it's in our nature. It's a fallen nature. We cannot, uh, we cannot develop. And, and, and that's, that in itself is a miracle. It's a miracle that God can give you a new birth and that God can renew your mind. See, you and I have, you, you and I have got two natures. When, you're, when you come to this world, you've got a fallen nature of Adam. Then when you're born again, you've got a nature of God, and that nature's not fallen. You, you cannot sin in the Holy Ghost nature. That's a sinless nature. You'd have to, you'd have to go back to the human natural nature. That's what Jesus had. He had a natural nature of a human. What he restored was was a new birth. He lived his entire life here and was a perfect sacrifice to go back to God and be acceptable so that he could send a new birth back to man through the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which would give you the character and nature of God that you could you could mature that nature unto perfection. You could never mature Adam's fallen nature back back to uh, perfection or to a total place of maturity. That's why under the law, it was impossible for anyone to go to heaven because no one under the law could ever reach a place of maturity. All they could do was understand what God's principles were and they could keep their flesh down, but they couldn't overcome it. They could never overcome it. They could never overcome the, that fallen nature of man until God, with a, the, the spirit of God's nature, that new birth in you, that you could develop that, that nature to a point 
of maturity in righteousness. It's like a nature, let's take a nature of an animal. That animal's nature can never, it's never, you can, you can make an animal obey you through training. God could make men in a fallen nature obey through training, but he could never get, get change their nature. You can't change the spots of a leopard, the prophet said. It's, that's impossible. But when God gives you a new nature and you become a new creature, then there is a nature inside of you that, and I've said this, maybe I ought to get up. Uh, I've said this several times um, that, uh, let me get my thought there, I've just about lost it. <clears throat> um, you're, here, here's, here's the thought, is, uh, Our mind, you grow up with a fallen nature and you don't have a new nature to bear witness in you. Remember what Jesus said when he showed how um, he showed his disciples in the 14th chapter of St. John, he said, the, the, this comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, he's been with you, but he shall be in you. In the day you receive it, you're going to know that I'm in my Father and He's in me. That nature's in me. And, and my nature's in Him. My, my connection is to that nature in Him. Because I'm born to the substance that he, that he gave me. He gave me His substance or His nature in, in my creation. Well... Jesus was talking to those disciples and they didn't understand what he was saying but what he was telling them was y'all don't have that nature. But when you get it, you're going to know that I'm, I'm in my Father and He's in me and we in you now. He's been with you but He shall be in you. That Holy Ghost nature is going to become inside of you. Now you've got two natures. You've got, you've got the fallen nature of Adam and now you've got the nature of God, a new man. You, you can't sin in that nature. That nature is a sinless nature. So you, you got to get back into Adam. If Jesus would have sinned, he would have, he would have been a fallen nature at that point, just like Adam became a fallen nature. He didn't have that. He didn't have the fallen nature man had when he was born. He just had a human nature and he had a natural mind. Our problem is, is that our minds lined up with the Adamic nature. Our minds, all of our minds became corrupt. Man's just a few days and full of trouble. He, you know, our, mind, our nature, our minds went with our nature. The corruption that was in the world, it... Our nature, our nature just naturally wanted to do what was corrupt. And, of course, like I said, you could train it. You could train it to go against your nature to do what's right. That's all you could do. You just obey it. You get away from it, you go back to, to your nature. It's like dogs. I've raised dogs and trained them for years and uh, you can train a dog, quit training it. Quit training it and just put it with another dog and watch what happens. He'll go right back to being a dog. You know, I got Brother, Brother Bud's dog here not too long ago, Brutus. He's a litter mate brother to my dog, Oscar. And uh, he never been around no other dog. And Brother Bud liked... Brother, he, he would, you know, it's a nature of a dog to be protective of their environment. So when another dog would run across the parking lot or wherever, and he, Brother Bud has a covered patio out the side of his house. That little dog lived out there on that patio most of the time. I mean, he'd go in the doggy door and go in the house, but he is out there, and a wild dog or a squirrel or something go across, he'd just go, he'd act like, I'm going to eat you alive. You just, 
you let me out there towards you, I'll show you this is my property and you don't come around here. And you could take him on a leash and he, I don't care if he's a German shepherd who weighed 125 pounds, he weighed 20 pounds. He had run out to the end of that leash like he's going to eat that German shepherd because he'd done that his whole life. He had no training against that. Well, I brought him home. And he, he wanted to eat all my dogs. You know, I got, you know, Tucker, he's as tall. He, he wanted to eat Tucker up. We'd hold him on the end of the light. He'd run up to him like, I'll eat you alive. Just turn me loose from this thing. I'll get him. And, and then he wanted to do that to Oscar and, Ab, and Maggie. And so we had to, several days there, we just had to hold him on a leash, put him in a cage. In a, a crate and you know kind of start getting him used to him finally we we was able to get them together one day one day and and I, I, tucker couldn't stand him he'd jump up in tucker's face and act like he's going to bite him tucker just look at him and of course we'd get on to tucker don't you you don't do nothing and then we'd get on to him and uh, him and maggie and him and Oscar got in a fight two or three times. I'd have to jump out of my chair. Sometimes I'd just have to kick one of them, knock him about ten foot to break them up. They had a hole in one another. And, you know, I'd have to get in there some way. In fact, one time I stuck my hand down there to get a hold of Oscar right there. I still got these scars right here because they bit me all the way to the bone in two places. And, you know. Anyway, I'm, I'm telling you this for a reason because... We pretty well had our dogs trained to, to not do nothing to Oscar. Just realize he's an idiot. He don't know, you know, he don't, bless his heart, he don't know how to act around another dog. Brutus, yeah. So, so one day Sister Smith on, on a weekend, on a, I believe it was on a Saturday, we went down to the kennel because for some reason or another, our help don't like working Saturdays and Sundays. So me and, me and Ann has to do all the work on Saturday and Sunday. And, <clears throat> I mean, we'd work them seven days a week if they'd do it, but they won't do it. Anyway, <laughs> I'm just kidding. They deserve their time off. We went down to kennel work. I was in the, I was in the puppy runs washing down. And I heard, I heard dogs barking. I, I stopped and went around and looked, at, looked in the backyard. And I could hear it barking back there. So I whistled and hear Tucker, he come running up to the fence, wagging his tail like, you know, you whistling at me? So I thought, well, they're just playing or something. Anyway, when we got, when Ann got through, she went back to the house. And Oscar, Brutus, was laying in the dirt like he's almost dead. And, and I mean, he'd, they'd been in a fight. He'd been in a fight, and somebody whooped him until he couldn't even walk. Well, I've got cameras around my house, so I backed him up and looked. They all three mauled him. I mean, him and Oscar got in a fight, but Tucker, even Tucker thought, I'm going to get in this little sucker right now because he's caused me enough trouble. You know, his nature, their nature's kicked in. And Maggie, she'd just bite any one she could bite. She'd just run up there and bite one and run away. She'd bite Tucker, bite Oscar, bite Brutus. she just, you know, I'm in this some way or another. She, her nature took a hold of her. Well, they'd never been in a, they'd never done nothing to no dog like that. Their nature just kicked in on them. <laughs> That's what happens to you when you blow up. You know, when you, all of us have got we, got, we got problems, folks. God help us. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death, Paul said. When I would do right, there's a law, he said, in my members. I, he said, when I would do good, evil's present with me. He, he, what he would do, he said, I, I don't do. What I would not, that's what I do. <laughs> well, he said, oh, God, who's going to get me out of this mess? Finally, he said, it's through Jesus Christ. Thank God, the Lord, help me out of here. And so, uh, 
So your mind, your mind lines up with this fallen nature, and that's why Paul said, Be ye, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what's happening to us. God, through the Spirit of God, God is giving us righteous principles through faith. It's not, you know, somebody just convincing you. That's what the law did. The law says hold your flesh down. You know, just learn these commandments and hold it down, you know, and be sure you keep this in your life until I can send Christ to help you get to a further place with a new birth, with a new nature. And when you're born again, now through the Spirit, I can begin to cause these principles to become a part of your character through that new nature. That new nature can take on these principles and it'll become a part of your character and your mind will start lining up with this new nature, this new creature, this new man, and when your mind no longer will coordinate with the old nature, the old nature ceases to exist because it doesn't have a vehicle to operate or behave in. Once you begin, and it's a spiritual walk, this, that's what I was saying, it's a miracle. It's, oh, it's a miracle of God that you can be born of a nature and be sinless. How many sinless men have y'all met? Or women? Yeah, you ain't met one yet. It's amazing that you believe it's possible. But we know of a man who can. We know a man that lived a life without sin, above sin. He never committed one. Well, he had a great advantage over you and I because he didn't have to renew his mind. He saw the minds of fallen natures. He was tempted to give over to that, but his father gave him enough and his the angels that helped him don't think Jesus didn't have an advantage over you, saints. He had a great advantage over you and I. However, he was susceptible to temptation and he could have fell just like Adam did. But thank God. Thank God that he lived above. He lived above sin. He never committed. He never gave in to it. Never turned over to it. So... Uh, uh. So anyway, <clears throat> oh, okay, this, here's a Revelations 5 uh, and 5 a question. The line of the tribe of Judah, Judah hath prevailed. What did he prevail over? He, what that scripture's talking about, he, he wasn't able to open the books. You know, there was, he saw a book sealed with seven seals. No man in heaven. That included those bride members that died and went to heaven. There wasn't no man in heaven before that. No man in heaven, no man in earth, or no man under the earth was able to open those seals. But Jesus, he, the line of the tribe of Judah, he was able to open those seals because he had became the high priest. He overcame and he was the, he was the only man that was perfected in the point that he had the place of a high priest and he's the only man that had the authority to do what he did and to open those seals and show the future of what was going to come to the Gentile church. So <clears throat> that's what that scripture is talking about. But he prevailed into the fact that he was the he was the uh, he he was
was our Savior. There's only one Savior. There's only one, there was only one Messiah that God sent here to do the work He did. And thank God He prevailed and overcame sin and, and lived up to the calling that God called Him and sent Him to do. And so He's the author and finisher of our faith and He prevailed to become that through his uh, journey here on earth for 33 and a half years. So now you and I, you know, like I said, we're, our minds are being transformed in that it, not only am I learning the commandment of God and the purpose of the commandment, but through the Spirit of God working in me and in that new nature, that my mind is starting to line up with that nature. It, it concurs with the new nature that is in me that, that God developed in my mind that now my mind understands true righteousness. That's what I've been trying to get planted is that what true righteousness is is when I get beyond the corruption of this fleshly fallen nature of man. We, we all have it. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's what makes you feel like, you know, sometimes like giving up because you keep making the same mistakes. The reason you're making mistakes is because you don't have the principle that destroys that the nature of, or the operation that's in that fallen nature. Once you, you get those principles, you, you, then once you get those principles, you, you've got to kill that in a way that it's going to take, it's going to take dominating in, in obedience. You know, first you've got to get the flesh down, and you're, you've got to do things like, you can't allow your mind to keep thinking things that keeps bringing you into the same arena of going around and around the same circle. See, whenever, here, let me tell you our biggest problem in this society. Our biggest problem in this society is self-acceptance, low esteem. That's our biggest problem. Because order and God's righteousness has been violated to a point that we, we all have these, these crutches. See, I understand it. You know, like I could give you a little bit of the history of my wife. I could give you some of the history of myself. As a matter of fact, that's the only testimony I've got that I really understand. But working with people helps me to understand what they've went through because I've... I've had to work with people to, to some of those points, you know. You know, I was a, I was a middle child. I, I was a, the middle child in the birth order. Their birth order has a big effect on the human nature. Because my brother, let me tell you about a firstborn. Uh, Olivia, she's a firstborn. See, she has no competition whatsoever with Emily. Emily's a, Emily is a middle, a, a, she's a middle child. And Emily, in all of her life, she's looked up to her sister. She honors her sister because her sister is a great example, good or bad. She has a tremendous influence over Emily. She's in, but Emily's in competition with her. She's competing because... She wants what Olivia has, but she will never have it, not in the fallen nature. She'll never have it because, and, and Olivia could care less. She's in competition at all because she knows who she is. She's the firstborn. Hey, you ain't, you're my little sister, and you always will be. That's settled. Settled in my mind. It may not be in yours. But Emily will always compete with her, and she'll always try to challenge her. That's just the nature. I'm just telling you. Maybe I shouldn't use him. Maybe I'll use Mickey and Fred, my older brother. I could whip Fred. I knew I could whip him. 
because in my mind, I had to know I could whoop him because he was my big brother and he was stupid. He wasn't as smart as I was. See, I built all that up in my mind because he's just a year older than me. He really had no right of being the big brother. Till one day, I was pestering Kent. Kent was six years younger. He's the baby. That's like Eddie. See, Eddie's the baby. She, she gets treated like a baby. Baby, she, she, she is the baby, and she gets everything is cuddled around the baby. Even the big sister will cuddle around her, but there's no competition there because big sister know she knows she's the one. See, Sister Smith's the firstborn. Oh God. You know why I married her? Because I felt comfortable around a firstborn. I always admired my firstborn brother. I, even though I competed with him, even though I never could have what he had, and I thought I was, I thought really I could take him anytime I wanted to. One day I was pestering Kent, my six-year-old younger brother. At the table, mother had went to work. Mom and daddy was divorced. He reached across the table and just slapped the fire out of me, almost knocked me out of my chair. He said, you leave him alone. Scared the way out of me. I thought, where did that come from? I know one thing, he put, he put enough fear in me that I decided I might not be able to whoop him. Birth order has a lot to do with it. I can tell you things about Emily, and I don't know her that all that well. I mean, I've been around them some. But I can tell you about her. She's way more sensitive than the other two. You know why? Because she has to. She has to be sensitive to understand what she's trying to figure out about the firstborn, and she has to be sensitive to the others. See, when I was a little boy, my mother and daddy had a divorce, and my dad was. He became an alcoholic. He was mean. He, he would whip my mother. He would beat her. My, my older brother never, ever did that seem like it bothered him anywhere like it bothered me. My little brother, it bothered him, but nothing like me. I was sensitive. I had dreams at night. I slept with a ball bat under my bed. I couldn't sleep. I worried because I was way more sensitive because I was a middle boy. And what my parents did, I was far more sensitive. When they got in an argument, my other two boys, brothers would be snoring and I'd be sitting up in bed listening. I was way more sensitive. Because that's middle. That's a middle child's sensitivity. That's the way they're made up. Their birth order has something to do with it. It builds an inferiority complex. But everybody's got it. But here's the thing with your inferiority complex. you got to realize what makes you, what is making me want other people to recognize me. Every one of us wants to be uh, noticed, don't we? We all want approval. We want somebody, put your approval on me. See, that affected me because my dad, my mom and dad got a divorce I didn't get the father's approval that I wanted, so I started looking for it through other men, my bosses, young and early in state, my teachers, whoever. In fact, I tried to make gods out of men for a while. Now, I'm not talking about things that y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. Every one of you has been through it to an extent. I don't think firstborns go through it as much as others, but it, there is an inferiority complex in every one of us. Because, I'll tell you why. Number one, we're fallen. We know we've got a creator. But we don't know how to get in relationship with him unless he comes to us and draws him, us to him. We still have to work through this fallen nature. And you're going to have to get to a place, you see, all of this inferiority complex of me trying to get you to recognize me Put your approval on me. That's a crutch. And that's you saying, somebody 
please honor me and recognize me and give me what I'm looking for. <coughs> Let me just tell you something. The more you try to get people to do that, the further they'll shy from you and the more you'll become stand, they'll become standoffish to you. And you'll have to grow to the place that you can say, when your mind goes there, you can say, I'm stopping that. You're, you're not going to think like this anymore. I'm not going to allow you to take me down that road and start walking around with those crutches on again. I know who I am and I can... God knows who I am and He's saving me. And I don't have to live like this. I don't have to live looking for someone's approval. God approves of me. And I know righteousness. I know right from wrong and I can do the right thing and if you can't accept me, that's your problem, not mine. And I don't need a crutch for somebody to tell me I'm okay. I don't need that. I've got a God in heaven that knows who I am and he's helping me all the way. Hallelujah. I can live above that crutch. And, and this, this world is suffering with all of that. But thank God this message, it'll lift you up. You can at least get control of it and get the flesh put down where it belongs and quit living a slavery to that crutch. And you finally can say, I'm going to hold this flesh down until God gets his work in me where that's no longer a part of me because that's a work of a fallen nature that doesn't need to be there, not in one of God's children. And so God's working on us. He's, he's trying to help us live above. First it takes, sure it takes, it takes faith. And you can't have faith unless God gives you faith. You can't muster up faith. I could convince you, I might, you know, I might debate with you and win the debate. Maybe I could even influence you in believing what I'm saying. But if God is not in it, let me tell you what it takes. It takes the anointed word of God. It takes whenever a man of God or whenever God, however God does it, if one of the people of God talk to you or God talks to you on your bed or in a dream, there has to be the spirit of God got to touch you with an anointing that helps you to realize God has talked to me and I believe and what God has done in my mind, what he showed me, that's faith. Faith comes hearing, by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And how shall they hear except there be a preacher? Except there be someone with an anointing that the spirit of God works through and it touches you. They might not even have a clue that they're talking to you. But God knows who he's talking to through them was it Sister Lacey was just talking the other day she said Brother Leninger was walking up down preaching on Sutton he just stopped and said by the way here's how this is and she said that was the question that was in my mind just like that God answered it for her then he went on to preach his message he had no idea what he'd done she did that's faith that's what works faith and that it takes God no man cometh unto me, Jesus said, except my Father draws him. So God, God has to have, he's got to see something in your life and say, I want to save you. I, I, right now, you're in a place that I can reach out and touch you and draw you, and I can draw you up for salvation and see if you'll respond. He can work faith in your heart. And if you respond to that faith, he'll carry you on. But you can't go, remember this, the, the, Paul said that he bowed his knees to God, to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that you might know the depth and the height and the length and the breadth. Well, the length is faith. 
you cannot go any further in this than what faith you've got. God has to give you faith in the word of God that he gives you. When he gives it to you, that's how far you can go. You can't go. You can't go where God's took somebody else until God gives you enough faith to go there. You've got, God has to, he's leading you. He'll cause you to grow. If you'll keep serving him, he'll keep, the light shines more and more to a perfect day. See, that God, you know, I mean, i got a flashlight. It just shines so far. I don't know what's beyond that light at night, but I can see the end of where that flashlight goes. That's like the Word of God. You can walk in what you can see, what light you have. That's faith. That's the link. That's as far as you can go. But if you'll walk in the, in, in the faith that you have, He'll shine more. He'll give you more faith. He'll give you more. He'll develop more in you. He'll give you more understanding, more instruction. The depth is humility. You you got to humble yourself enough before God that you can get low enough that God can recognize that he can show you who you really are and that you're humble enough, that you're not rebellious, that you're humble enough that he can uh, give you instruction that you'll receive. If you think you're high in what you are, you're not going nowhere until he gets you down to a humble place where he can show you, you need me, you need this. He can keep showing what you need and you can be humble enough to receive it. And then the fear, the fear of God is, uh, that's the, the breadth. The breadth is God, the fear of God, to keep adding more of God, keep recognizing more of Him. It's like Sister Smith was saying the door today, when God starts dealing with you, you start getting more broken and you start realizing your need for Him and you're getting more fear, respect, and honor for him, and he can add to you. And that's, that's the fear of God until you can inhabit the whole of what God's trying to give you. In the height, that's honor. You cannot get up beyond, you can't get any higher than what you can honor and respect. That's what this scripture we was working on today. You can't get any higher. If you can't honor your mother and father, you, you ain't never going to honor nobody. Your, if your parents didn't, don't teach you how to honor them right, and you can't fear and respect your mother and father, you'll never respect your teacher. You'll never respect your boss on the job. to a place you understand God's principle of order. Yeah, a lot of people miss it. Google don't even understand this, I promise you. (laughs) Yeah, see, she's having trouble. You don't have to touch it. It's just the way it is. (laughs) It's just the way it is. The world will never get this. That they want you to have out there in the religious world is, is that God's already paid the price and you already got every bit of this. I promise you they ain't got zip. They just got a little surface of salvation. This gets right down to separating the men from the boys. This will save you. This will save you. This will make you a new creature with a maturity of true righteousness in its, in its finished work. We're his workmanship, but we, we need to be his finished workmanship. Hallelujah. So God's working on us. He's, he's trying to help us, but we got to get, we got to, we got to realize what God's doing and we got to be able to see ourselves 
God's got to help us to know who we are, and you got to know where you're at. Now, if you're if you're if you're trying to live above where you're really at in God, you're a facade, and that's blaspheming the name of the Lord. That's blaspheming to try to live above where God really has you. But God has to help us. God has to help us to actually know, you know, where I'm at. I had a man recently, I was telling him, I said, I know who I am. I was telling an elder in the body, I said, I understand who I am. He said, Brother Smith, you you got more influence in this body than you think you've got. Well, I don't think I got as much as he thinks I got. <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't use your influence beyond what you have. See, uh, when I, one time I realized uh, learning in this body I had to understand that you know when I, I had got to a place where there, you get to a place in a church when you first come to a church and God gives you this revelation you'll think Whew, these people are angels they're almost perfect they've, they've nearly made it I've, I see what they're working on and I want it but why am I so late if you hang around a while, you'll find out they're not as far as you thought they was. In a little while, you'll start realizing all the problems in the church. You stay in a church long enough, you, you quit living a facade and start seeing where you really are and where that church really is and where different people in it are. And I hung around the body long enough that I started seeing the problems. I started seeing corruption in the leadership. And that discouraged me big time. And so I got in a negative attitude and started telling God what I was wrong with it. And I started losing confidence in some leaders because I saw things in their lives that I didn't appreciate and I knew it wasn't right. And I got in a negative attitude. And one day <clears throat> when we lived on the farm in Missouri, I was driving down the dirt road on one of the back road, farm roads. I don't know, I was probably going to check on cows or something. And I was, I was telling God about things. I was telling him how, what, what was wrong with this body. And the Lord spoke to me. Hmm? Yeah, he said, the Lord, he spoke to me and he said, what you want is for me to put you in charge of this body. I pulled over in a ditch. It, it scared me so bad, I thought, that ain't, I know, I said, no, that's not what I want. You ever tried to argue with God? It's like he don't know what he's talking about. He knew exactly what he was talking about, and he was exactly right. Here's what he told me in that ditch that day. He said, anybody can tear down. Anybody can find faults. But you haven't walked in the shoes of the men that I call to be leaders of this body. You haven't suffered what they've suffered. And I can't trust you near as much as I trust them. He said, but it takes a lot more to be able to roll up your sleeves and go to work help building instead of tearing down. And I realized that day, I began to weep, cry, and repent to God. I realized that day, I got to quit bickering about what, you know, this is the best God's got, even in their faults. And I thought, what I need to do is figure out how to build with them and honor who they are and the positions they have and what I don't agree with, I need to shut my mouth. But what I agree with, I need to work on and honor that and build with them in that. And that changed my life. I was dishonoring my fathers in the Lord. I 
I began to learn. I began to learn how to take even if I was treated wrong. I worked under men that treated me wrong and I honored them in every inch of it. I never, ever rebelled, neither did I back talk them. I might have been Johnny standing up on the inside, but they never seen me stand up. I was sitting down on the outside and that's all I'd let them see. But I got to where I could sit down on the inside as well as sit down on the outside and honor those men. And the Lord also told me this that day. He said, if you gain enough influence that your voice can help establish righteous principles, I'll use you. I realized that day. I got to, I'll never, let me, let me just tell you, men. Y'all supposed to know this. Surely to God you already know it. You think I'll use any one of you men that don't show me the right honor? You're a dreamer. You think I'm going to put a man to help me work on what I'm working in that I know don't trust me and don't honor me right? And neither will any man that's over any church or any group of people. It's just nature. It's just the order of authority. You, you work on a job, you get to where you're, you get to working with your boss and you figure out what their mind is and you get behind them and help them do what they're doing, I'll promise you, you're on your way to, you're on your way to uh, being lifted up. You're on your way to being promoted. You're on your way to promotion. That's the word I want. You're going to get raises and you're going to get promoted. It's just the order of authority. God helped me so much that day. I started building with this body. (laughs) Nobody, nobody in this body walks up to the head table and sits down. If they do, you'll get your stuff moved. If you don't belong there. The only way you're going to get promoted in this body is God's going to use men that our leaders that recognize principal men and they'll lift them up in time. One day I came into a meeting and somebody came out to me out there in the congregation and said, you got a seat at the head table, Brother Smith, that's where they want you. I like I fell out of my chair. But there's been a seat there ever since. I didn't choose to do that. That still don't mean that you're equal with the cheaper men got to work. You got to work. You got to build. It's an order. It has to do with honoring your mother and your father. What does the proverb say? It, it is a ornament of grace to your head and a chain to your neck. It's, it's part, look, when you, when you get dressed up, the way you dress means something. The way you present yourself means something. So somebody look at you and always see someone in order in life. They're not just. <laughs> there's a advertisement on uh, an ad on TV where this girl sitting down at dinner with this guy, and she's she's dressed up nice, and he's got on this old raggedy T-shirt, and his even his neck is all wrinkled around around the collar. Have you all seen that? (laughs) And it's advertising some kind of shirt that won't do that. (laughs) I I don't even know really what it's advertising, but I I see that deal every once in a while, and I think myself, the guy needs to straighten up and get more presentable. The way you dress means something, and then an ornament. See, if you just put a little brooch See, Sister Crow's got a little brooch on her, on her shoulder there. That stands out. That adds. That's a little ornament of grace. It adds to her, present, her presence and her presenting herself. It's an addition. And then it says a chain to your neck. That's like jewelry that, you know, in other words, you've added something else that makes you even more presentable. You know, now, you, you, 
you know, everybody knows. You can overdo it. You know, you don't need to be like the world. Here's what I tell women about makeup. Let me tell you how you are to wear makeup. If you wear it where somebody can tell you got it on, you got too much on. It's just an enhance. It just it, you could enhance a little bit, but nobody ought to know. I mean, you sh- you shouldn't look like a clown. I mean, I, s- I see women with, you know, they got so much eye makeup on, it's all matted up in their eyelashes and a dark, you know, they look like a clown. I don't say nothing to them because most of the time, you know, it's, none of my, it's not for me to do. Except right now, I'm, I got a little bit of authority to say something. Anyway, I'm just saying... Honor. When you honor authority and those that are over us, it adds to who you are. It adds to your character that's being presented to this world. God's God's put something instilled a principle in you that causes you to have the proper respect. And then, that scripture is a killer, isn't it? Even when those you're respecting treat you wrong with your respect. And you take it. You're reviled and you don't revile again. What an example that is. That's like, you know, that kind of goes along with the scripture of heaping cold, of heaping uh, water. One, I was going to say, use the one about cold, but it also it's like pouring ice water <laughs> on somebody. When they do you wrong and you treat them right, well, they, you know, it's just hard to keep hitting somebody that just won't hit you back. You know. That's what Brutus did. When he found out he couldn't win that fight, he just laid down. They just chewed on him a while, but when, he, when they seen he wasn't going to fight, they just all walked off. Thank God they'd have killed him if he hadn't have done that. That's, you want to keep from getting killed? Just don't revile. When you're reviled, don't revile again. <laughs> They'll leave you alone in a little while. Oh, God. Well, I guess you can tell I could go on with this. And I've already went past our normal time, so let's take up the prayer request and receive the tithes and offers so we can go home. But since you're not here on Wednesday nights and oh well every once in a while I've been going over here lately. So the brethren will come. We'll take the prayer request. Uh, let's remember these we mentioned downstairs, Brother Arnold in Wichita. They're, they had an elderly sister go to the hospital last night that lives in the apartments there with COVID. I don't know who's he, Brother Green didn't tell me her name and I didn't ask so Let's keep playing for Wichita. They, they've really been, he's had over 40 people with COVID in the last month. And they hadn't even had a church in four weeks today. So, uh, but maybe they'll be able to have church next week. Sister Gail. You know, Brother Jordan come home with COVID and, and I think Noah got it. And now Nikki's got it. Does Sean have it too? Wow. Eshan's the only one that's not shown any symptoms yet. So let's pray for for them, Sister Kayla's mom, brothers, and family. Uh, don't forget, Sister Kayla and Brother Eli's getting married December the fifth. So. Keep that in your mind. Pray for them.
Sister Hannah was exposed. Her her co-worker at work came down with COVID. Um, it's been a week, but she found out, you know, that she's got it, tested positive for it, and has been. She's been sick. But she finally got tested, and so Hannah and Caleb aren't here today because they've been exposed, or Hannah has, and so she'll get tested tomorrow because it's been about a week, and see how she's doing about whether or not she can come to church next week. Pray for Sister Amber. She works at Dillard, Dillard's, and they're having, you know, regular Black Friday, uh, and so she's worried about many, you know, being there uh, Friday and that, you know, of course, the more people you're around, well, the more, even though she may wear a mask, she doesn't know what all be required of her, you know. So anyway, she doesn't know whether or not she even ought to come to church. I appreciate that, that people want to be careful that we don't get exposure here. So let's pray about that. Uh, Brother Arnold, I mentioned, Brother... Uh, yeah, I mentioned people, just pray for Wichita. They have really went under it, but they are about to seem like, to me, about to come out of it and do much better. So what else do we need to pray for? Sister Holly? Brother Mark Marler and his wife and family there. Um, Brother Paul McGowan, yeah, he was a little bit sick this week. He, Friday he thought he was feeling better, but he said, if I'm not feeling fine, I won't come to church Sunday. So he didn't come today, so we need to pray for him, remember him. Keep remembering Brother Wallace, uh, the Weavers, McPhee. Sister McPhee is absolutely deathly fearful of this virus and she just started walking. she's working at, out of her house but she won't hardly come out of her house I think you know it's more her than brother John the reason they're not here I don't think it's so much him sister McGowan okay also brother Daniels called in today and said he's just too weak um, they just the doctors just aren't able to get his medication regulated where he can, you know, feel like, uh, you know, whether he's having these roller coaster ride he's on with it, Sister Durham. Yes, Sister Abraham. Remember her. She had surgery, you know, um, gallbladder surgery, but she she doesn't seem like she's getting over it real quick. Sister Sandra. for Brother York too. He's he's very fearful about, you know, with his heart condition, he's very fearful about getting out and uh, so pray for him. Yes. All right. Yes, Brother and Sister Fisher, Brother Stanley and Sister Linda. Let's remember them. Keep them in your prayers. All right. Sister Crow. Okay. All right, Sister Crow, remember her back. Sister, late, Sister Crafter. Okay. All right, remember that, uh, Sister Wilson. Yes.
remember Sister Angie Elder, Sister Cindy's mother, Brother Keith. Okay, yes, he did tell me. All right, if you'll stand with me, the ushers will come. And let's ask God, dear Lord, help us today. Touch, touch all these that are mentioned here today. God, reach out to them and touch them and help them. Lord, those that are sick in their bodies need your touch. Those that have these other issues, oh God, we pray that you would touch them and help them, oh God. Precious Lord, precious Lord, God, we love you today and are thankful for your goodness to us. Oh God, for hearing our prayers and your hand on our lives, your good word of God. Oh Lord God, what you're doing in our lives and touching and helping us, Lord, we give you praise today. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. Oh God, help us with this water situation here in the church. God, oh God, we know our need for you and your help and your guidance in life. Precious name of Jesus, we give you praise, Lord. Amen, amen, amen. God bless the people today as they give. Hallelujah. All right, you can be seated. We'll receive the offering. Your tithes. God bless you as you give today.
Mr. Uh, Kayla, do you want me to announce, make this announcement? Okay, their, their wedding will not be here in the church on December the 5th because her mother has COVID and she won't get out of it in quarantine time, time for their wedding. So, uh, I'm going to still marry them, but it's not going to be a church wedding. It'll be a simple wedding, and then the church will put our blessings on their wedding when we can get everybody through this, and we don't know how much time that's going to be. And for some strange reason, Kayla and Eli don't want to wait. And then Emily. Emily, what I said about you today, your place in birth order is what makes you a special young lady. And those aspects and characteristics that I've mentioned is what makes you, will cause you to develop into a beautiful young and an outstanding, you'll become outstanding because you'll see to it that it happens. That's what middle children do. God bless your hearts. I'll try to talk to you Thursday night and shake hands and be friendly. Thank, Thursday's Thanksgiving, yeah. So be thankful and give I like pumpkin pies, pecan pies, lemon pies, and coconut cake. <laughs> Thanksgiving. I like turkey and dressing. <laughs> I'm just going on.